It reached the Earth after traveling through infinite layers of time and space, only to remain unheard. Thus, we called it ironically the voice of God. Ghost in the Sand by Carlito Cunagulero Fragment found on server servers, reads by Umberto Eco Arthur. Editor's Note We hereby present to our dear reader a revised version of the diary of one of the most prominent and influential women in the history of space exploration, Zerka Stern. The following excerpts refer to the expedition on the board of a spaceship Perseus, in which the authoress took part as a postgraduate researcher. While the text is written from a purely subjective point of view, we believe nonetheless that it might provide the reader with an insight of a significant historical value on the matter concerned. The reader should be aware that, due to the authoress' specific background, the scientific precision of her observations remains a debatable issue. Yet it has also been observed among the commentators, that in her reflexive, sometimes deeply intimate writings, Zerka Stern often seems to be speaking in the name of all humanity, which makes her diary a somewhat poignant testimony of its time. Even though, eventually, it raises more questions than it provides answers, especially at the end, when the diary abruptly ends. No changes have been made to the original text, except for minor typing and punctuation corrections. All the titles come from the authoress. The Voice of God At first there was a call that no one yet understood. It reached the Earth after traveling through infinite layers of time and space, only to remain unheard. Thus, we called it ironically the Voice of God. I was not even born at that time. The faith of all mankind was about to be decided without me being taken into consideration. Long before I started gazing the stars, some of the greatest minds of all human science joined their efforts in order to unravel the puzzle of what was assumed to be the first message from a distant civilization. Linguists and mathematicians, philosophers and informaticians, statesmen and spiritual leaders started to debate the nature of the enigma. No one knew for certain whether the signal was a real act of communication or just the random noise of chaos. God may have been calling, but we were unable to answer the phone. However, some of us just wanted to believe. By the time I pronounced my first word, many eloquent hypotheses had emerged. Some researchers established that it was neither a question nor an invitation. Others thought the signal merely to be an open message, the same sort of interstellar postcard that humanity had sent long ago in order to reach any intelligent life in space. After many years of fruitless deliberations, just when humans were about to abandon the idea of contact and helplessly embrace their loneliness in the universe, a group of linguists from New Zealand proposed a new hypothesis, according to their theory based on comparative grammar and code breaking, the message said. We shall come. It could mean anything. But the mankind, commonly projecting its own vices onto all that is extraneous, chose to consider it a threat. Just in case. And as humanity never surrenders, we decided that we shall be prepared for whatever may come to visit us. The thing is, no one came. The New Era As the ceaseless movement of growth and change in cosmic navigation, kept pushing further and further the boundaries of the unknown, the human species became a frequent visitor in most remote galaxies. By the time when I boldly began to take my first steps in my father's backyard, space had already become my home. Literally, because my dad would paint the walls of my bedroom with little shiny comets, moons and constellations. Cosmos also became commercialized on an unprecedented scale. You had your cornflakes in shapes of planets, in every pack of crisps you found maps of star systems and fancy gadgets to boost your imagination and push it towards some sci-fi adventures. Even burgers were being named after starships and rockets. Cosmic imagination also fertilized the world of art. Lots of songs and visual media were strongly influenced by visions of space travels and alien contacts. In some ways, I reckon, many of us took interest in interstellar studies because of that trend. 
there was some sort of romantic storytelling about space discovery, a glorious, Americanizing narrative that eventually resulted in an ironic proclamation of one stand-up comedian. We the people of the Earth, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this constitution for the United States of the Universe. Thus, humanity entered the new age of discovery, which was named after the era of great geographical discoveries resulting from the European expansion in 15th and 16th centuries. As it is well known, that distant period of exploration was also called the Age of Contact. Yet during the first decades of the new age of discovery, no contact was made whatsoever. The mysterious signal from a distant galaxy was far from being regarded as an urgent matter, at least for now, because other issues emerged. As for me though, at the age of two I still knew very little about it. With the notion of distance changed the notion of time. We started to live longer, but the greater part of our existence was now spent in hibernation. Soon the state of awakeness became an almost insignificant fraction of our being. The further we ventured, the longer we spent with our neurobiological functions almost completely shut. Given the lack of REM phase, no dream would come in the state of hibernation. But those long periods of mere vegetation caused some particular mental problems. People began to manifest an increasing tendency to daydreaming during their regular activities. An entirely distinct branch of psychology had to be created, that would deal with space neurosis, nostalgia and identity disorders linked to the excessive amount of time that our conscious minds were spending in some way disconnected from our bodies. Although during the endless nights of interstellar drift we had no dreams at all, strange visions would come to haunt us once we woke up. Some of them were mere fantasies, some of them nightmares. Those issues would significantly affect the mutual understanding and communication among the astronauts. Now, that's where I enter the scene. I deal with words and dreams. While the human race kept venturing further and further towards the unknown, I graduated from high school and joined the program of five years formation in space psychology and alien communication, the only cool thing loosely connected to interstellar affairs, that I could actually be good at with my poor mathematical skills. Soon I learned quite a lot about what was going on up there. With new challenges, new technologies emerged, with new technologies, new problems. New solutions had to be conceived in order to respond to the ever-changing needs of our audacious endeavors. First, the whole industry of food supply had to be created in order to provide the astronauts with essential nutritional values during long periods of space travel. Spaceships were equipped with entire factories farming artificial meat produced in vitro from extracted animal cells. New robots had to be constructed to take care of our torpid bodies during hibernation. Others were developed to give us entertainment. The artificial beings began to serve our amusement as companions, comedians, competitors in sports and, of course, partners in erotic relations. Fortunately, the advanced machine learning enabled robots to communicate with us with ever-increasing capacity of imitating human emotions, sense of humor, wit and understanding. Then again, they needed data, a human input was necessary so they could constantly process our behavior. That is where I saw my chance. With a considerable amount of determination, I started a six months course in language programming and simultaneously I entered my PhD program in alien communication and potential linguistics on Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Against all odds, I was fulfilling my father's dream. The world kept turning faster and faster as I slowly moved towards my graduation. Many engineers hoped that robot learning would as well be applicable for non-human intelligent living entities that could be better understood with the help of human-made artificial intelligence. Just like it is done with natural languages. For indeed, everybody was aware that sooner or later our exploration of space could eventually bring about the long-awaited contact with an intelligent alien life form. It was a matter of time, they said.